Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Your Intention Matters, the podcast. Thanks very much for joining us. My name, of course, is still Paul Madot. Today, I have Jimmy Gagnon. He is Director of Sales over at Vidyard in KW. Jimmy, how are things, man? Things are going great. I mean, I, I've, I've said it before, but uh, this time of year, uh, as a sports fan, you've got you know the Raptors who unfortunately lost in playoffs. You've got the, the yeah. Leafs who are starting in playoffs. You've got the Jays who are on a tear. The summer months are coming, golf courses are opening, you know, there's a ton to be excited about right now. So things are going great here. I, 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 I so echo what you just said, man, really, and great win last night from the Leafs. For those that are listening and watching, we're recording this on May the 3rd, and the Leafs just crushed Tampa Bay uh, to the tune of 5 nothing to kick off round one. And so Jimmy and I are both jacked up, and Jimmy, thanks so much for being here. Say hi to everybody, provide a quick intro, and then uh, let's jump into your episode. Yeah, perfect. Very nice to meet everyone. My name is Jimmy Gagnon. I'm, as Paul mentioned, the director of sales here at Vidyard. Um, been here for about seven years. Paul and I are cross paths back in, in the Xerox days. Um, father of two. Um, got a wonderful wife. Uh, we've just got a new puppy. His name's Berkeley, so he's keeping us busy. Um, yeah, as Paul mentioned as well, avid sports fan, big hockey fan. Um, got into coaching this past uh, this past year. So I coached both my son and daughter's team uh, and then just uh, just got the news that I landed a, a head coaching position for the under 10 MD team here in Kitchener. So excited excited to uh, to chat about uh, kind of my, my past and life leading up to, to sales and, and where I came from. So husband, father of two, full-time job, full-time coach, dog owner. Okay, man, we're, we're going to get through this podcast. I know you're stretched, so I appreciate the time, man, really. Yeah, no problem. That's uh, the one thing I learned going into leadership is you got to be able to manage your, your own schedule. So it takes a, takes a small village in the Ganyan household to, to manage yeah, that. Absolutely. We're, we're so, you know, Jimmy, so listen, we were talking about the podcast and, you know, listen, we don't script this. There's no pre-questions. We're just going to go. Uh, your intention matters because nothing's really given to any of us. Most of us in the world of sales never thought we'd even get into it. And with that said, let's jump into your journey. You ready to go? Let's, let's do it. All right, here we go. Let's go back in time. Yeah, exactly. So, so we go back in time on the podcast, Jimmy. Let's go back to Acadia out in Nova Scotia. I see here sociology and history. I'm a huge history buff myself, but I don't see a sales career here at all in terms of your education. So did you have a vision for being a teacher? Did you have a path for education or what were you thinking you'd be doing, you know, with that type of foundation? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's a good question because I think back then and I, I always I always say I I really admire you know 16, 17, 18 year olds who have a career in mind. They know what they want to do at that age. Uh, myself, like I'm sure the vast majority have no idea. Yeah. Um, and calling a spade a spade, I, I went to Acadia on a hockey scholarship. Um, education wise, like kind of you know, scraped by in, in high school, uh, kind of giving you know, the effort that was required, not, not anything above, um, you know, got into Acadia, which is, you know, probably one of the best schools, obviously I'm a little bit biased, but, uh, in Canada, um, they've got a, an awesome hockey program It's based in a small town of Wolfville. You literally know everybody in the, in the city or in the, in the town, um, but went there and basically got in with, you know, sociology kind of start out sociology, added in some some history so I graduated as a double major um and at the time you know took a few business courses and, and liked it but you know wasn't really applying myself to you know the education piece I often tell my wife now looking back you know had you applied yourself the way you applied to yourself to to an actual you know career now doing that in university how much you would have got out of it yeah I wasn't that that fortunate maybe it was immaturity but you know, kind of got got through there and, uh, and had a great time doing it. You know, Jimmy, I don't know enough about, uh, you know, getting to college, university on a scholarship uh, and and so on. But if you're there for hockey, was there ever any 
aspirations or opportunity for you to play pro hockey, whether it be over in Europe or in the A or ECHL? Was there anything on your mind that I, I, I want to try and do this? Or was hockey simply uh, your way of getting your education? Yeah, I'd say a mix of both, right? Like, so the way it works, I played in the OHL for four years. Um, and basically, as you play a year, you you get a certain package that goes towards your, your scholarship. Mm. Um, and although I wasn't a high, a super high draft pick, I negotiated in because I had offers to go to, you know, Ohio State, Bowling Green. And at the time, they, they wanted me to play some exhibition games, which would kind of disqualify me from from uh, my, my schooling power uh, from being able to go, go and get an education and play in the US. Um, and so basically the, the way that worked, I finished my last year of junior, um, had applied to a couple of schools and a couple of different schools came down to watch and, and wanted you to kind of take a tour of campus and that type of stuff, uh, which was super fun. Um, I had an opportunity, so I was playing with the Plymouth Whalers of the OHL at the time. Um, P. Carbonis owned the Carolina Hurricanes he owned the Florida Everblades, the Lowell Lock Monsters in the AHL, um, and then and then the Plymouth Whalers. So I was offered um, a tryout with the Carolina Hurricanes, which I say to, to this day was kind of like my my biggest regret in not taking it, but also you know a good idea because I already you know know the personality. Had I gone tried out for the Hurricanes, would I have made it? Chance I'm probably not. I probably had less than a one percent chance of making that team. Uh, was guaranteed a spot in Florida for the East, East Coast team. And I knew if I kind of did that, I would end up uh, kind of grinding it out without an education. So I made the conscious decision, of course, in chatting with my, my parents, um, to not do the tryout. If I still wanted to do that after school, I'm sure I could pull a few strings and, and see where I could go uh, and decide just to go, go to Acadia and had you know four awesome years there left with an, with a, an education. Um, and then went and played pro hockey actually in Australia for a year. Um, and then after that, I was going to go to Rio Grande Valley, but opted at that point to say, you know, between us, Paul, I, I had a bit of a short fuse, so I'd, okay. I'd be fight, fighting a lot and it just wasn't really worth it for, you know, three or 400 bucks a week to, to kind of go and do that. And I, you know, I had a, a, a my, my girlfriend, my wife now, we've been together since high school, um, and I think it was time for us to kind of to, to start our lives together at that point. So made the, the choice to that's, that's that from a, from a hockey standpoint. You know, man, I, I had no idea that you, you even that you played anywhere near in that level. So if I, if I have my, my sequence, right, you actually played in the OHL, which is the breeding ground for NHL drafts. I mean, that's, that's the league that people aspire to play in if they're going to get drafted. And yes, you have the U S college program, but the OHL and the W and the Q are the three big ones you make it there. And then you literally have a shot to go try out for like the pro Carolina hurricanes. And you go, you know what? Yeah, it might be fun. It might be, you know, worthwhile doing, but am I going to make the team probably not? And I, you know, the Canadian guys that are listening to this right now are probably thinking, how could the guy not go try out at least? And so I'm, I'm so enamored by the fact that you, you decided, no, I need to bet on my education because my future is not, it's either NHL or bust. Cause I don't know how hockey players get paid, but it sounds like from what you just said, unless you're at the tier one level, you're kind of grinding out, you know, your paychecks and it's not really this, this life of caviar and, and so on and so forth. So that, that's incredible that you did that at such a young age. Yeah. I mean, I think, like I said, it was, it was a regret, but I think it was also a very wise choice. There's, there's other pieces in behind the scenes, right? Uh, back to playing exhibition games disqualifies you from certain things. So I'd committed to Acadia, had I gone, you know, had a chance, maybe, you know, had the opportunity to play an exhibition game with, with the Carolina Hurricanes, that would disqualify me for a year of, of university, right? So oh, is that I kind of knew what was at stake and, you know, kind of said it's, it's probably... The best choice to go and, and do this focus on on getting this done um and you're still young at the time like you kind yeah. of leave school when you're 23 um and there's been a couple of guys uh joel ward is is one of them uh who had a, a lengthy career after playing out in uh, upi in the you know the aus uh, hockey league right so he got his education moved himself up um and and actually had a career in the nhl so um you know guys like that also 
you know, kind of keep you motivated to say there's, there's, there's a good chance. And the, the hockey that goes on now, all of the, the folks that play, you know, university hockey across Canada now are all usually ex OHL, um, WHL, you know, junior B, you know, guys from the queue. All right. So the, the quality of hockey is incredible. And, you know, a lot of folks out, especially out East kind of get spoiled because the only thing really close to that, that area is the Halifax Moosehead. So anything, I think west of it, you know, the, the Acadia Axemen are, are kind of, you know, they're, they're fixed when it comes to hockey. Jimmy, did I get, is my timing right? You said that you played uh, pro hockey. You lived in Australia for a year. Was that post Acadia? Yeah. Okay. How yeah, did that so, come about? Yeah. So like most university students, it's like, okay, we're, we're graduating. Let's do this, this backpacking Europe trip. Um, mm. And then we kind of strolled across this league where they, they would actually pay for your flights over. Um, they hook you up with, with jobs and, and housing. Um, and we got an opportunity. There was um, one of my best friends, uh, TJ Eason was playing for UPEI at the time. Uh, and then the goalie on our team, uh, Lanny, uh, and myself all kind of went over and then two other guys went over and played for a different team. So we all kind of flew across, across the globe, played wow. in this, you know, Australian hockey league, which was uh, a, a bit of a wild league. It was a ton, a ton of fun um, and made some awesome friends. I still keep in touch with a number of guys that I, I met from Australia. Um, so, you know, it was, it was pretty incredible to think that we didn't know much about it. We got these flights, the, you know, the owner of the team, you know, kind of took a risk and said, yeah, like come over at least now they've got um, hockey DB, which is kind of a database so they can see where you've played. Cause you yeah. know, historically they've brought Canadians over thinking, well, they're Canadian. They've got to be good. And, and these, these, you know, some of them have been busts. So uh, kind of took a risk on us. We had a, an awesome year an awesome team and, and a ton of fun doing it. Did you go down with any type of timeline in mind? Was it a year? Are we going to be there forever? What were you thinking? Well, so there, there's seasons off season of ours, right? So our summer would be their winter, mm. um, which a lot of guys now are going over there just to stay on the ice year round. Um, and we were going there to, to kind of play the, play the season. And again, you know, I had an offer to go to Rio Grande Valley after the season was over uh, to fly over to, it's right on the border of uh, Texas and Mexico and go play there. And my friend TJ, he, he was, uh, he signed up to, to do that as well. Um, and then I just opted not to. And then the goalie that we were down with, he had one more year left at Acadia. So he went back to Acadia and played there uh, before uh, becoming a, uh, a full-time police officer out in, in Winnipeg. So um, yeah, timeline wise, it kind of weighed like being that far away from your, your family and, and, you know, my, my wife or my, my girlfriend at the time, you know, it was, it was tough. So, mm. you know, kind of played through the, played through the season, you know, spent some time doing a little bit of traveling and then uh, made my way back. So you made your way back to where? Are you from Toronto? Uh, so I'm from Kitchener. Kitchener. Um, yeah, born and raised in Kitchener, then kind of had that hiatus, uh, you know, from from hockey where I played out in Peterborough, played in, in Michigan and out in Acadia and Australia. I uh, moved back and, and my girlfriend and I were like, well, I mean, what are we going to do? So uh, yeah. her her parents had, had a, uh, a condo that was in Collingwood. So we moved to Collingwood, got ourselves jobs. I got my my first job was uh, was shipping and receiving at Blue Mountain, uh, and I mean most of their workers were seasonal, right? So the, the talent pool and people you could rely on wasn't wasn't overly high. So I was able yeah. to to make my way through there and, and landed a job doing purchasing uh, for Blue Mountain, um, which was was awesome. And that's you know kind of spawns us into how I got into sales in the in the first place um, through through that job because I was dealing. 100% of the time with with sales reps and I think there was a, a meeting and it was the the gentleman from Nestle mm -hmm. he was a great great guy and we were chatting and I was like what am I doing on this side of the table I should be on the other side of the table uh, right and that that kind of got me thinking as to what my next career move was going to be and uh, turned out it was going to be in okay. sales Cool. You know, it's funny. I, I hang my hat in calling with these days myself. So where you're talking about 15 minutes from blue and like the great experience over the village. And so um, how did you find Xerox? Did you find them? Did they find you? And what was that process like? Yeah. So um, I had a couple of friends who had worked for Xerox and, and as I was kind of, you know, getting into it and, and asking around like, where's a good place to start. I think everybody and their brothers and their sisters said, you got to start at Xerox. They, mm. They've got the program to, to get you up and running. Um, 
Uh, and so I reached out to a, a gentleman uh, who I ended up, um, you know, his daughter was, was working for me, uh, Brittany Smith. So I reached out to Ron Smith, who owned the agency uh, up in Owen Sound at the time. And the territory I was looking at was in Collingwood to Orangeville. Um, fast forward through that, um, Ron had hired me, but ended up someone else needed to take that role. So he said, hey, would you be open to moving back home to Kitchener? Um, and, and working for Mike Norwich, I'm not sure if you remember Mike. I remember but Mikey, was, I remember, I remember Ronnie awesome as well. As well. Yeah, yeah both, both like salt of the earth, great, great guys. Um, and ended up working for, for uh, Mike. So ultimately a little bit of seeking on my part, but some recommendations of folks who had, who had worked there and, and uh, gone on to do some, some great things, whether it's with the Xerox or, or outside of Xerox. So that's, that's kind of how I found it. You know, Jimmy, I want to chat with you about your initial experience with Xerox because it sounds like, you know, you, you were, you had an aspiration for sales and then somebody even said to you, Hey, if you want to go somewhere, Xerox is a great foundation for you. When I joined Xerox, I didn't have that. I, I was out of work. I wasn't in the sales brain at all. And some guy, some guy, sorry, but one of my best friends says to me, I got a guy that I went to university with. He, he has a, a sales team at Xerox. They're hiring. Why don't you go apply? And I'm like, sales, like, I, but I'm like, well, why not? I, I'm out of work. So what's the, what's the harm? So I went, but I went in with a six month mindset of I'll give it six months and I'll see how it, uh, how it plays out. It ended up being almost 10 years in the end. But my first year at the Xerox agency was so hard for me. I just, I, man, I just could not figure it out. I was in early. I was out late. I was feet on the street. Remember the mindset at Xerox? You got to be in front of customers in the car, like run, you know, owning your territory. And I was doing all of that. Like that was wearing through my souls. Like I was working so hard, man, but I just couldn't figure it out. I don't know how I mentally got, I must've mentally quit six, seven times from my first year. And so I'm curious about your experience in, I'm assuming it was hundred percent commission. Like I was. Uh, on the agency level, did you take to it right away? Was it hard or was it a little bit of both? I think it'd be a little bit of both. I think like any, any role, right, where there's incentive to do well, um, you know, financial incentive to do well or, or career uh, progression incentive to do well, uh, naturally for a guy like myself or, or you know, any, anyone who's been, who has like an athletic background or has applied themselves to something for a you know a period of time naturally has a lot of that determination and grit that's going to get you through and, and part of it is mindset like you've mm -hmm. got to have thick skin um and kind of my my upbringing and, and kind of what i did from hockey gave me extremely thick skin right especially from a young age so um going into it yeah like it was difficult it's not easy and that is one of the most sink or swim you know um totally type companies that you can you can be in uh but again it comes back to uh your co-workers it comes back to you know mike norwich who is just just an awesome guy um to kind of help you through those and kind of see what what's on the other side um and so yeah it was it was very difficult i i picked up a lot of it pretty quickly just based on you know not being shy to be outside outside of my, my comfort zone um and, and really watching some of the, the other reps who were really good um, and how they, they did it and, you know, taking the advice and, and applying the advice that you get to, to yourself, meaning that it's like, I can't do it the same way they're going to do it, but what, what can I take away from it and, and make yeah. it my own? Uh, and I think I kind of got that part quickly. Um, and yeah, I think I stayed at the, the agency for at least two years, which you know, is, isn't common because it's, it's tough sledding and yeah. let's, let's face it. Like that's, if you want to be able to understand how to sell value, um, you know, a, a photocopier or printers, they're, they're not sexy, right? No. They're, they're not sexy at all. So you've got to figure out, you know, the business side of it and, and what actually is going to help you sell on some kind of value. So extremely difficult, but I mean, that's the foundation of the basics that I still have today in, in trying to build up other, other sales reps on my team as well. And how so, many years were you with Xerox in total? So I was there for a while. So I, I was there, I did, you know, some, some of the agency stuff that kind of was like a lead within the agency, uh, did some direct stuff and then moved into that uh, field, uh, 
field training manager type role that I'm not sure if you did, but I know our our, uh, our friend Sean Allen was was in, and I kind of took over his his territory as he he moved up. Um, I think in total, I was I was probably there close to like six seven years anyway. Interesting. So you you had a good run with the company, and to your point, you know, in, in a uh, you know really sink or swim environment. Not, not to say that Xerox doesn't care for you, but it's really, there's really, there's no leads. I mean, you got a little bit of a base, but you really got to get after it. And especially early on in, uh, on the agency side. And so, no, I didn't do the, the FTM role. I went right to the sales instructor role at, uh, for new hire, uh, mm-hmm. which, which was the greatest, most fun job I ever had at Xerox. It was the lowest paying job in my career at Xerox because it was a staff role and it is what it is, but um, yeah. it was, it was the most fun I ever had. And I did that job for three years. And I'm curious about your transition from individual contributor per se into, you know, kind of a support role. Did you like that role? Did you seek it out? I did. I think I was kind of at a crossroads where I was like, you've, you've kind of been doing the same thing. Um, sales fundamental wise and foundationally, I've done a lot of like mentorship, especially within the agencies. Um, I've got kind of like coaching in, in my blood. I, lo- I love doing that. I love seeing, you know, success through others when they put the, the work in. Like that's, that's to me more, you know, inspiring than, than closing a massive deal myself. Like that's, that's cool, but I don't get the, the same out of it. Um, you know, the, the transition over, um, again, Mike, Mike at the time was, was the agent owner and talking to him, I think they used to always uh, use the word CLM, a career limiting move. That's and right. Caution to say, you know, this could be a career limiting move for you, right? And you've got to, you know, think about what, what you can get out of it. And he said, you know, you, you get good at this and you, you know, you, you understand what you're doing. He's like, that's, that's what you're going to take with you to the next role, whether it's with Xerox or outside. But he's like, you've got to be able to position it that, you know, you, you still can sell and stay as close to selling as you can so that that next role you're not kind of pigeonholed into, you know, getting into to something that you don't necessarily want to because now you've been out of field for two years, right? So yeah. he had caution, and that's exactly you know what I what I did is took took that, started to build out my own framework around how I would teach and different things that I would bring into the agencies to help support them, um, honing in on presentation skills and public speaking and you know getting those those pieces out. And that's a unique role because you're also dealing with the agent owners themselves. You've got yeah. to make some tough decisions and you've kind of got to be part of, of that because at the end of the day, we're, we're all working for the, for the same, you know, you know, company. Um, so it was, it was an interesting role. I, I really liked it. I, I enjoyed it. And, and actually my next step with, with Xerox uh, as well was going over to the TLC to, to do what you're doing. Um, and I had worked with Sean and run a couple of weeks solo. And then I would, you know, go in, you know, every couple of weeks and do a couple of days uh, there uh, and get mm-hmm. some FaceTime sort of with, uh, with the folks, I believe Leanne was there at the time, yep. um, you know, to try and put my name in the hat for when, when that does, you know, come available and you know, we've, we've got a couple of uh, options. So that was kind of where it was, I was leaning towards as well, because yeah, it's a ton of fun. Uh, you don't have the upside incentive on it, but it's, yeah. you know, something that if you do have that passion and being able to follow careers right i'm still uh, if you remember when we we handed out the uh was it the pen the golden pen yeah something like that there is there is a gentleman by the name of ryan lazar that him and i split the pen that week um and i still talk to him to this day he's in a very similar role with a company called qualtrics and, and he heads up canadian operations so being able to have that 15, 16 years later, love it. still bounce ideas off of and, and kind of draw back on that is, is incredible because I had never talked to Ryan prior to going there and we, we kind of crossed paths here and there and then we kind of ended up in, in a very similar uh, position, which is really cool. So Jimmy, talk to me about the decision to move on from Xerox. I mean, you'd been there for, you know, six to eight years type of thing, six, seven years and great relationships, a number of different roles. I mean, Ronnie gives you a shot. You, you work with Norwich, great guy, figure it out on the agency level. You make the move over to the direct side and then you move into training. And, you know, if there's any, you know, company that really supports training historically, it's Xerox and there's, there can be a runway there for you as well. And after that length of time where it's pretty much all you knew from a, from a selling professional 
perspective, did you seek out Vidyard? Did, did they kind of come calling because you were in a training role and, hey, look at this role? And what was behind that? Yeah, I would say it was a, it was a couple of things, right? There was, you know, I'd been there for, for eight years um, and was kind of craving something new, something a little bit more tech focused. Um, at the same time, I just, we had just, uh, I think we had just had my daughter. We're going to have our, our daughter, which would have been our second child. Um, a lot of a lot of travel time was involved with that that role, and it's not the, the good travel where I'm I'm flying out to here or there. Like I'm right. I'm on the highway, right, driving out to Gravenhurst uh, to support that agency, which which was was awesome too. Uh, but it was just a lot of time, and then you, you you know your priorities kind of change, and it's like, hey, Kitchener here is is a tech hub, a very strong tech hub, you know, um, coming off the foundation of, of BlackBerry or RIM. Uh, and then kind of spawning off into a whole bunch uh, of different uh, companies locally. Uh, I had known a guy actually from Acadia who was the, he played football there uh, and he was the, uh, the bouncer at the local bar. So we had a couple different run-ins, but, uh, but Carl uh, worked for, uh, worked for Vidyard. So I'd reached out to Carl and I also knew the director of HR at the time because I'd played uh, co-ed volleyball with her and her twin sister. Uh, and some, had some conversations with them and loved the company vision. They were very small at the time. I think I was employee somewhere in like the 50 range um, and went back there as, a, as an individual contributor um, with the hopes that like I can, I'm going to get back into leadership. Because with, you know, with Xerox, I had the opportunity to, to manage teams. I got the opportunity to manage, you know, a, a process. Um, and from there, it was like, okay, I had, I, I like the, the management aspect of it because there is a lot of coaching involved. There's a lot of, you know, planning and organization, which historically has been my weak, like a, a weakness of mine is, is making sure I'm planning in advance. So doing those things forced me to get better at it. Um, so I went in, into to Vidyard and, you know, ended up getting, uh, getting the role. Actually, the gentleman who, who hired me is now the VP of uh, revenue and, and I report directly into him, which is is funny. After, like I said, seven or eight years here, uh, we're we're still kind of together and, and to at a different capacity. But um, that's kind of how I made my my way in. It was it was really based around family priorities, making sure I'm I'm going to have the ability to to be to be home and not be on the road quite as much and, and help out uh, my wife and we had a, also had a son at the time, um, and then kind of just you know wanting to get into what I, I thought was going to be. A, a little bit different of a career choice and something that, you know, wasn't a hard good if I was selling software. So there was a ton that I needed to learn about selling software and, and how that works. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's, that's how I had, I made the, the transition over to, to Vidyard. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with that FTM role that you had a lot of miles, but no life flat seats, no airport lounges. It's all, you know, in the car, putting the miles on the car. And so, you know, I, I have great admiration for Vidyard. Uh, you guys have invited us in to do some work with your salespeople in the past. And so you're a client of ours and I'm a client of yours. I love the technology. But I imagine, Jimmy, that when you joined Vidyard was when? What year was this? I think it was 2015. Okay. So 2015, I imagine, you keep me honest here, Vidyard 2015 is was not the vidyard of 2022 you guys have been growing from what i see and it sounds like the value prop has really taken off but what was it more of a startup at that time or kind of not quite where it is today and like were you were you really taking a risk here and kind of betting on yourself in your opinion at the time yeah i think any any transition that you make is is taking a risk right um we were very much a startup at the time there was, we had a lot of things going for us where we're first to market. We had a, a you know a unique product that really solved a problem. Um, but yeah, we were, like I said, we were probably around 50 some odd people. Um, you know, we've, we've since, we're, we're now at 330-ish, something like that. So we've, you know, had some hyper growth, growth over the last year and a half, uh, but it was a completely different product um, at the time. And the other part was I, I knew some folks who were who were there and, and met with them. And a big thing about, you know, working, especially in a, you know, at the time in, a, in an office environment was the culture. Uh, mm -hmm. And Mike, uh, who's a co-founder, Devin, uh, who's the other co-founder, 
you know, what they've built here from a culture standpoint, even though we are remote now for the most part, um, you know, is instilled with, with everyone. Right. And it's, it's kind of the mindset of like, we're here to help each other. And, you know, it doesn't matter cross function what team you're on, you're going to help out because it's for the, 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 the great good of the, the company. And we all have the same goals of what we want this company to be. Um, and it was, you know, it was contagious when you, you, you chatted with everyone. Um, it wasn't pushy. It was like you're, they were up front, like you're, you are taking a risk here right? We've got big goals and what we want to be able to do. And we, we need, you know, folks to be able to accomplish it. So I was kind of sold uh, both, both on the, the interest of the product. I, I saw the interest and I could understand the value that it provided uh, as well as the, the, the company culture and the fact that they were, they were local um, was mm -hmm. a huge draw for me. So yeah, that was, uh, that was a long time ago, but you know, it feels, Jimmy, feels when... nice to be talking about it now. I love it because you've been there for, if, I, if my math is right, 2015, seven and a half years or so as we move into the middle part of 2022 here, uh, tremendous growth within the organization. And I imagine that, um, you know, in the last couple of years, you touched on it, you guys have seen tremendous growth because we as, as individuals have had to figure out, well, how do we communicate differently? Because for the most part, that in-person meeting uh, what was kind of taken away and it, it forced us to get creative with, well, how do we still stay relevant? And you, you can't just take a flyer for two years and sit on the sidelines. You still got to earn. It's expensive to live. And so I imagine the value prop of Vidyard in your industry was, was um, uh, highly regarded when one whole offering or option was taken out of the equation. But what I'm curious about is how did you guys as an organization uh, handle 2020 and 2021 working remotely and still keeping the people engaged because I get your value prop is there and the company is growing. So that's good, but you still have to get your team fired up and keep them, you know, motivated. And it's hard when people are just totally isolated for a long period of time. So how did you manage that? Yeah. I mean, it was, and, and we're still managing it, right. It's, it's still not the same. The, you know, the, the best way I can put it is, you know, for the most part, we're all having these remote meetings, but, and, and we're trained naturally, you know, when you're live and in person or you're on the camera uh, is to bring that energy level. So you bring it. Uh, but after we have our one-on-one -on -one or after we have a conversation and the, the, the camera goes off, I have no idea what, you know, what, what type of state you're in. And yeah. so there's a couple things that, I mean, as a company, we've been very supportive and we're becoming more and more supportive, especially from a mental health standpoint and, and providing different outlets and making sure everyone is aware, like we've got unlimited vacation, which, you know, as salespeople, it's like, yeah, we've got unlimited vacation, but like we aren't allowed to take vacation it is trying as leaders to promote. Like I'm, I'm going to be off this Friday. I'm going golfing. Um, please don't message me. If you message me, I'm not going to respond. Um, and trying to set the stage for them to realize it's okay to take time off. If you, you know, your body and your mind more than, better than, than I would. So you've got to be able to, you know, be vulnerable and speak up. If you need time off, take the time off because it's, you know, it's not worth it for you. It's not worth it for, for the company to have you, you know, unhappy working. Um, but yeah, it's been, it was tough and it was tough for a lot of managers and myself included, you know, in, in managing those managers to go through a period of time of unknown. We haven't done this before. Yeah. How do we, how do we, you know, keep people excited, but at the same time, um, take care of the people when they're not beside you to, to give them a hug? Like, how do we, you know, how can we do that? Um, and so we've, we've tried a number of different things and, and some of the things, you know, really worked well, some, some didn't. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it came down to communication and making sure that everyone was open to be vulnerable, um, to, to let you know if, if they needed help with something, right? Because when you're remote, you can feel like you're isolated on an island. And if you don't have that, you know, that culture that's willing to back you up and help you, uh, it becomes very difficult. And so we want to try and make sure that you know, everyone from your, your teammates to your leadership, to senior leadership, to, you know, you know, executive leadership is all there to, to talk to you, to help you. Uh, so we're, we're, you know, we really tried to do a lot of that uh, to make sure that our, our people were, were okay first and foremost, because that was from a business side, right? From critical an outside world side, it was, <clears throat> it was insane. Like, right. And it, it still is, is crazy. So it's like, how do we keep our people safe and make sure that they, 
you know, they're, they're there for their families and they're, they're there for, you know, everything else that's going on outside of just, you know, trying to, trying to make money for the company. Love it. You know, Jimmy, what a great ride you've had, man. I'm going to try and summarize this. So you, you go to Acadia on a hockey scholarship, you're, but you play in the OHL first. So you're kind of dabbling with maybe there's a pro career here. If I can really crush it in the O you realize, okay, so I've got a shot to maybe try out for a pro team odds are stacked against me. If I do this, it costs me a year of eligibility at Acadia and so on. So you kind of go, no, I, I need to really be, be smart with what I'm going to do with my career. You go to Acadia. It sounds like you have a great time there. A fantastic school, great relationships. And then Australia comes calling and you kind of go like most of us out of college. We go, okay, well now what am I going to do? I got to figure something out. So why not take a shot? I'm still young. You go to Australia for a year. Uh, and to your point, it was, a, it was great. I'm sure a great experience, but not your foundation. You missed your family. Your girlfriend, now wife, was not there. You come home and then you find a job at Blue Mountain. You're kind of, you know, bumming around the village and you, you're kind of behind the scenes and, and it kind of, I want to get into sales. Uh, you, you kind of realize that. And then you find, I'm biased here because I went through it, but I, I brass knuckles tough, like selling copiers, feet on the street, commoditized industry. But you, you work for one of the big boys in Xerox at the agency level. You make it over to the direct side. Great relationship. Seven years. You, can, you, don't, you, you have to figure out what you're doing to be there that length of time. Multiple roles into the training side as well, which nobody just gets that job if you don't know what you're doing. There, there, there's, there's too much emphasis on it. And then you make a decision. You have a crossroads and you realize, okay, I want to, more, I want to get into tech. Um, I kind of had my run with Xerox. Thank you for the foundation, but I want to do something different. And you joined Vidyard. And as I alluded to earlier, Vidyard uh, in 2015 is not the Vidyard that it is today. And so you really kind of bet on yourself. You believe in the value prop. In the meantime, you're a husband, father of two, and you manage the pandemic. And so congrats, man, on everything you've been able to create up until this point. I'm so happy for you. And I'm, I'm thankful that you shared it. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Good, good summary too. Did I miss anything? No. Uh, Go Leafs. Not that, I, not that I can think of other than, yeah, big, big Leafs fan. They're up one, nothing. You know, I had trouble sleeping last night after the big win. My son, who's, who's eight, he had trouble sleeping. We let him watch the first period. Then he, Love it. he begged us to watch the second period and then he couldn't fall asleep because he was too excited. So. So, you know, it's funny, a little, a little trick that I have with my son, he's only six, so uh, he, he hasn't quite comprehended first, second, third periods and so on. So whenever I put him to bed, I usually let him watch a little bit of the game, the Leaf game or the Jays game or something just to, he likes to see mm -hmm. a little bit of it. And as soon as there's a commercial, as soon as I'm at a point where it's like, okay, he's done. Okay, game's over. There could be nine minutes left in the period, but it's like, we go to a commercial. Okay, the whistle, the game's over and he goes to sleep. So that's my little trick with Nicholas. It works out pretty good. Well, that's good. Yeah. Hold on to that one. Cause they, they get smarter. Yeah. <laughs> I, it won't work with my daughter at eight. I know she's too smart for that. So, well, listen, Jimmy, man, great to reconnect with you. I really appreciate the time. Congrats on all your success. And uh, thanks for sharing your story, man. Really. Awesome. Thanks so much, Paul. Great to connect with you as well. And thanks for having me on. You bet. All right, everybody, we're going to wrap it up right now. Remember your intention matters. Why? Because that's the result you'll tend to get. We're out of here. We'll do it again next week. Let's go, Leafs.